thanks, Destin and Gretchen. I am Pastor Brian Coffey. I'm the campus pastor at our South Street campus, and I'm so glad to be with you all today. But before we jump into our new series, let me just bring you up to speed for a few moments on our North Aurora campus, which will be Chapel Street's fourth campus, scheduled to open, we hope and pray, uh, this coming fall. You may remember that a few months ago, a very generous and anonymous donor offered to match 50% of the amount still needed to open that campus debt-free. So about $550,000, amazing. And we're thrilled to announce that so far, you as our church family have given $425,000 toward that amount. We are so thankful for your generosity and for God's faithfulness to us in this project. Our goal is to reach the $550,000 mark by June 1st. So if you haven't jumped into this project yet, you still have a couple of weeks to do so. We would love to have you do that. We thank you in advance for your generosity. We are very excited and looking forward to what God is going to do through our North Aurora congregation. Well, as many of you know, uh, my wife, Lorene, and I have four sons. Uh, for many years, we kept track of their growth on a door frame in our home. Uh, maybe some of you did the same thing. And for those of you who know our family just a little bit, uh, those marks uh, on the wall just kept going higher and higher and higher until, alas, all of them were taller than me, their dad. So when people saw us all together as a family, they would say things like, what are you feeding those boys? And my answer usually was, well, cereal, chocolate chip pancakes, and uh, Pop-Tarts, what else? Actually, my wife uh, did a great job of giving them reasonably healthy meals so they could grow. But then they would look at me uh, and the relative height against my boys and say, well, what happened to you? And I'd say, gravity. Uh, gravity plus time. And I just say to everyone I can, I used to be much, much taller. But we know it's the, the nature of all living things to grow. For example, baby blue whales. They weigh 8,000 pounds at birth, and then they grow at a rate of 200 pounds a day. So think about that, you new moms. Uh, there's a Chinese bamboo plant that once planted takes five years to break the surface of the ground. But once it does that, it grows at the rate of 30 uh, inches, excuse me, 30 inches every day. Interestingly, there are other types of bamboo plants that grow that way for about 60 days, and then they stop and never grow again. As human beings, we're also created to grow. We grow physically, of course, that's what the marks on the wall are all about. Uh, in fact, if a human infant doesn't grow, it's called failure to thrive, and that's a very serious condition. We are created to grow physically, but more than that, we're created to grow relationally, intellectually, and spiritually. In fact, one of my favorite little verses in the Bible is when Luke talks to us about Jesus as a young boy. And in Luke 2.52, he says, And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Now, this kind of growth is uh, more difficult to see and to measure, to quantify. Uh, but if we're not growing emotionally and intellectually and spiritually, it can also be called failure to thrive in its very serious condition, because that which is not growing is dying. Last week, we finished eight weeks in 1 Peter called Living Hope. And today we begin in 2 Peter, a new series called Faith That Finishes. And if you were with us at all during the last series, you know that Peter's first letter was written in about 64 A.D. or so to Jewish background followers of Jesus scattered all over the Roman Empire. And the theme of that letter was living with hope and joy even as they face suffering and hardship. Now, the second letter is written maybe two or three years after the first one, and it focuses on a slightly different challenge that the early church was facing. That this first generation of believers is now facing the challenge of false teaching and false doctrine that was causing confusion and dissension in the early church. So let's begin 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read the, uh, the first few verses and then we'll dive in. Peter writes, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pause there. Notice how Peter introduces himself. He says, servant and apostle. In that order. And that's interesting to me. Remember how he talked in the last series about the importance of humility in leaders, humility among all believers? I think he's actually demonstrating some of that humility right here. 
He says, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. A couple small things here. He says, to all followers of Jesus. It means no matter what background, no matter where they've come from, no matter Jew or Gentile or slave or free. And then he says, who share a faith as precious as ours. So he's saying your faith, no matter what your background, no matter how far you've come out of that background, is as precious and valuable as mine, an apostle of Jesus Christ. In verse 2 he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord. Now that's a typical greeting in an ancient letter, but I want you to pay attention to that word knowledge. It's going to become a theme throughout this letter. Verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So I'm going to stop there and get started. The first thing Peter is saying to us here is that we have everything we need. Everything we need. I want you to imagine um, sending your son and daughter off to college. Uh, some of you have done that. Some of you may do that. Or maybe you were the one that went off to college. Um, as parents, it's natural to want to give your children everything they need for success in college. Clothing, bedding, supplies, books, uh, notebooks, alarm clocks, uh, maybe a small refrigerator, maybe a small microwave, some spending money, maybe even eventually a car. And your hope, of course, is that they will take advantage of all the opportunity you're giving them, all the resources you're providing, and that they will apply themselves diligently to the process of learning and growing. At least that's your hope, right? Look at what Peter says. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Peter says God has given us everything we need. Two things to see here. Uh, God's given us all we need. He's given us all the spiritual resources that we need. But where do those resources come from? What does he say? He says from His divine power. Which means there is no end to the resources he provides because there's no end or limit to the power of an almighty God. And then what are the resources for? Uh, to get straight A's in school or to get that job of your dreams, to get a house in the suburbs? No. He says, for a godly life. That's God's purpose. And what specifically are the resources that he provides? I want to mention three things. He says the knowledge of him who called us. Now, this word knowledge uh, is, is, it means uh, a, a kind of knowledge you gain from firsthand experience. So Peter's uh, not talking about knowing things about Jesus. He's talking about knowing Jesus that is living in a personal relationship with him. Secondly, he says he give, he's given us his promises. Verse 4, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. His very great and precious promises. Now what are God's promises? If we go back to Peter's first letter and to the rest of what we have in the New Testament, we can say that the, we have received uh, from God, the promise of a new heart. Peter said, we, were, we are born again into a living hope. And that's through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We have our sins forgiven. We're given new hearts. We're given new identities. He calls us the elect. That is, God has chosen us, and by His Spirit, we are adopted as children of God. New identity. We have new purpose. That is, to serve Christ and His eternal kingdom by using the gifts that He's already given us. And then he, he promises us a new destiny. That is to live and serve and reign with Christ forever in the new heaven and new earth. And that's the source of our living hope. Peter is telling us we must not only know God's promises, we must believe in God's promises, we must experience God's promises personally, and we must live our lives in light of those promises. And then thirdly, he says we, are, we can participate in the divine nature. Now, what does that mean? It means that through Christ and the involvement of the Holy Spirit, we are invited to share God's own life and holiness. Back to the college illustration. 
You can give, as parents, your children everything they need for success in college, but you can't give them success. You can't give them good study habits. You can't uh, give them personal growth. They have to make that effort themselves. And that's the next thing Peter says here, because the second thing we see in this passage is faith requires growth. Faith requires growth. I wonder how many of you um, had children or have children now who are learning to play musical instruments, you know, piano or trumpet or violin. Uh, if they did, can you remember what those early days of practice sounded like? Uh, all four of our boys took music lessons growing up. Uh, they all took piano or, or trombone. Some took percussion. They all, a couple of them tried playing guitar. And at various times, there were two or even three of them practicing at the same time somewhere in the house. And early on, there are a lot of sounds, but there's not a whole lot of music. In fact, beginning trombone sounds a little bit like uh, wounded blue whale. Sorry, son. Um, in his book, Outliers, an author named Malcolm Gladwell popularized what has now become known as the 10,000-hour rule. That is, to become proficient in any human endeavor, it takes about 10,000 hours of dedicated and focused practice, whether it's playing violin or shooting a basketball or preparing and preaching a sermon. It takes practice, and that's true in faith as well, Peter says. In verse 5, he says, For this very reason, since God has already provided everything you need, make every effort to build your faith, to add to your faith goodness and the knowledge, uh, and, and goodness knowledge, and the knowledge self control, and the self control perseverance, and the perseverance godliness, and the godliness mutual affection, and the mutual affection love. Now, if you're paying attention right here, you should be asking, uh, wait, 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 how can you possibly add anything to God's gift? How can we add anything to the grace God gives us? Well, we have to understand, Peter here is not talking now about salvation. Salvation is a gift. There's nothing we can do to add to it or earn it. It's a gift that comes to us by faith. Peter here is talking about something else. He's talking about what we call sanctification and sanctification is the process of being made holy. It's the process of spiritual growth. And it takes our cooperation with the Holy Spirit to achieve that growth. Peter simply wants us to know that our faith, while our faith is a gift from God, it also requires growth. Sometimes I hear people describe faith as um, letting go and letting God. And I understand that, and there's some truth to that, uh, but it's only useful and appropriate when it comes to things that we can't control and shouldn't try to control. However, that phrase, I don't believe, is appropriate at all when we're talking about our own spiritual growth. I sometimes think that we see faith as a kind of a one and done thing. You know, believe in Jesus, get your sins forgiven, go to heaven when you die, boom, done. I mean, that's like going out your driveway, picking up a basketball, making one shot and thinking you're ready for the NBA, or learning to play chopsticks on the piano and thinking, oh, now I can go to Carnegie Hall. It doesn't work that way. It's true that when we come to faith in Christ, we are born again. We receive the gift and the guarantee of salvation, but then we grow. Peter said in his first letter in chapter 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into your salvation. What Peter's telling us is that spiritual growth is not like physical growth. It has nothing to do with chronological age, because spiritual growth ideally never stops. I want you to think about this. This is Peter writing. He identifies himself as an apostle of Christ. He spent three years with Jesus. Personally, uh, he's now an apostle, a sent one to deliver the gospel to the world. He spent 30 years, the last 30 years, with men like Paul and James and Mark and Luke, learning and growing together, and he's still talking about growing. In fact, the apostle Paul himself wrote in Philippians chapter 2, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, Paul in Philippians 3 says, not that I have, I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul here 
and Peter as well, is teaching us that faith properly understood, is a living thing. It's a dynamic process of growth that lasts a lifetime. Spiritual growth is not accidental. Spiritual growth is intentional and it requires intentional effort. Peter writes, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. That word effort in the original language means um, a kind of zealous diligence, uh, with enthusiasm. There's a sense of urgency about it. It's like, a, it's like a coach saying, guys, guys, let's get after it. Years ago, I remember going to um, the old Chicago stadium to uh, see a rookie named Michael Jordan play basketball. And the Bulls that night were playing the, the Boston Celtics, so I was excited to see uh, Larry Bird play uh, in person because at the time he was the MVP of the league. Uh, Michael was just a rookie, so nobody really knew what he was going to become yet. So I got to the stadium like an hour and a half before the game. Uh, and I was surprised that when I got there, only a few people in the stadium, there were already two players on the court uh, working out. And they were going back and forth, full court, just gray T-shirts on, working on different skills. And one of them was Larry Bird. And I was astonished. I thought to myself, this is Larry Bird. This is one of the best players in the whole world right now. And he's in an empty stadium an hour and a half before a game, working on his skills, practicing. It was surprising and amazing. Now, here's the truth. Some kinds of growth are natural and require very little intentional effort. Like children don't have to try to grow. They just grow taller naturally. I, for example, don't have to try to grow heavier. There was a time, time in my life I tried to gain weight. Now I don't have to try. It just happens naturally. Other kinds of, kinds of growth are profoundly unnatural. They require great effort, like learning to play trombone or maybe the oboe. Peter here lists seven dimensions of spiritual growth that all require great intentional effort. I'm going to go through them with you briefly. He says... Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. The word he uses here means moral virtue or moral excellence. It's what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4 when he writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What I want you to notice today is that our goodness comes as a result of our faith. Our goodness doesn't earn salvation. Rather, it's the result of our salvation. It's really important to get those things in the right order. Secondly, he says, grow in knowledge. Now, this is a word, again, that doesn't mean just information. It means functional knowledge, relational knowledge, the applied wisdom of God's word. And teaser alert, Peter is going to go on to use some form of this word 16 times in the first three chapters. Knowledge. Self-control. This is a word that means self-mastery. It's what the ancient writer of Proverbs meant when he said, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. It means learning the personal discipline to choose that which requires effort and is better over that which is easy in our lives, like a college student getting up for an 8 a.m. class, or like a follower of Jesus, choosing to show grace and love to someone who does not return that grace and love. Perseverance. This is a word that means endurance under pressure. It's what Peter's first letter was all about, a kind of gritty and tough and enduring kind of faith. And then godliness. Now, for many of us, this is kind of a churchy-sounding word, but it just means living in a right relationship with God and therefore, a right relationship with other people. Mutual affection. Literally, brotherly affection. It's the Greek word Philadelphia. Love for Christian brothers and sisters in the family of God. And then finally, this great word love, which is the Greek word agape, which is used for the unconditional love of God, love for neighbor, love even for one's enemies. Now, I just want to mention a couple things here. We need to know that these spiritual qualities that Peter mentions are not like a, a salad bar from which we get to choose our favorites. Oh, I like this one. I like this. I'm not very good at that one. I don't like that one at all. No, not at all. These are for all of us all the time. Here's a little challenge. Uh, sometime this week, take these seven 
spiritual qualities and write them down on a piece of paper and do a little self inventory. Give yourself a score, you know, A, B, C, D, or F, or a score of one to 10 on each quality. If you're not sure what your score is, ask your spouse, or maybe ask one of your children, or ask a friend. Just think about them because God intends us all to grow in all of them. Second, I want you to see that these qualities are all interconnected, like those old strings of Christmas lights, you know, if one would go out, they'd all go out. That's kind of what Peter is saying. And when Peter says, make every effort, effort to add, he's actually saying that we can, we can, each one of us grow in all of these spiritual qualities and we can never stop growing. But that growth requires effort. Now, the third thing he says in this passage is that growth produces fruit. Growth produces fruit. Um, I played uh, sports in high school. I've talked about that many times. But when I was a sophomore in high school, I was playing basketball. And um, we were not very good. I think we finished the season like 2 and 16. But I was playing and starting on the team. Uh, and we lost our last game of the season. I remember, I don't remember the score was, but it was embarrassing. It was in our home gym. Um, and at, I scored exactly one point in that game. I played the whole game, scored exactly one point. And there's nothing worse in basketball for me than making one point. If you have zero points, people think you didn't even play. But if you have one point, it's just pretty pathetic. I missed all my shots, and I had five free throws, only made one of them. And I remember after that game, standing at my locker um, and being so frustrated, feeling so ineffective and unproductive in my, in, my, in my basketball playing that I was, I was crying. I was trying to hide from the older guys, but I was, I was, tears were coming out of my eyes. And I decided that day I would, that that would never happen to me again. I realized it wasn't the coach's problem. It wasn't my teammate's problem. It was my problem. And all I needed was a ball and a hoop and the willingness to put in those 10,000 hours. And so I practiced. I practiced a lot over and over again at the hoop of our house, at our house, before school, after school, sometimes in the middle of the night, over and over again. And a couple years later, by the time I was playing ball in college, I once made 191 free throws in a row in practice without missing. And to this day, I can make about eight out of 10 if you give me a chance to warm up. But that's what Peter says about our faith. He says in verse eight, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, if you are growing in these ways, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Now, I don't know about you, but that line there is kind of terrifying for me. I mean, who wants to get to the end of their life and look back and just see ineffective and unproductive? Peter says, the, uh, ineffective and unproductive is like a barrenness. It's like a tree that doesn't produce fruit. It's like a tree that stopped growing somewhere along the line. But what is the fruit we are to grow? The fruit he's talking about is a life that absorbs the resources of God grows and then produces an overflowing blessing that goes out to the kingdom of God and other people. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 15 when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, ineffective and unproductive. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And in verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Peter says, if we, grow, if we are growing and productive, we will not be blind. That is, we won't be like walking through our lives aimlessly, not knowing our purpose, going blindly through life. He says, we will not forget that we've been cleansed from our sins. We will not forget who we are in Christ. And then he closes with these words. Verse 10, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a lot there, but let me just focus on that little phrase, a rich welcome. That can be translated an abundant entrance into Christ's kingdom, a lavish reception 
in Christ's kingdom. The image actually is of a triumphant athlete coming back home to a great celebration of his achievement and victory. Now, the Bible promises that all who put their faith in Christ, from the most immature to the most mature, will receive the promise of heaven. That's a guarantee. But the Bible also hints that there will be greater rewards, a, a greater celebration of those who have demonstrated fruit, those who have demonstrated great faithfulness, those who have grown throughout a lifetime in becoming more and more like their Lord and Savior. Many years ago, my dad, um, who was a pastor, accepted a call to become the pastor of a small, struggling church uh, in Florida. And when he did that, he inherited a group of elders, leaders in the church, that included a man uh, who was in his 70s, who my dad quickly learned had been uh, an elder like forever in the church. But he demonstrated almost none of the qualities that Peter's talking about here in this letter. He was critical, judgmental. Uh, self-righteous, hard to be around. So uh, the next uh, year, when time came around to renominate elders for leadership in the church, my dad left him off the list. And when the guy found out, he stormed into my dad's office, pounded on his desk and said, I demand to know why I'm not an elder. I've always been an elder in this church. My dad said, sit down, Harold. So he sat down and my dad said calmly to him, I didn't nominate you because... You're one of the most self-righteous and self-centered men I've ever known. And you don't deserve to be an elder in this church. And they talked uh, for a while longer. In other words, he was like the bamboo plant I mentioned early on that just stopped growing. It was like a child who did not grow. He was ineffective and unproductive in his faith. It was failure to thrive. Now, to his credit, that man, starting that day, did take those words to heart. He humbled himself. And he began to grow in his 70s. We're never too old to grow in Christ-likeness. Peter says, we've been given everything we need. You've been given everything you need. So make every effort to grow up in your faith. Would you bow with me as we close? Lord God, I thank you today for your word. We thank you for this ancient letter written so long ago to people at a different time, in a different place, in a different culture, but could have been written yesterday to us. Remind us by your Holy Spirit of all that you have already given to us through Jesus. Remind us that we already have everything we need, but teach us, encourage us, call us to grow up into who we already are in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.